If you haven't heard about silicon carbide and wolf speed stock, then consider yourselves lucky. Uh, if you have, then you're probably suffering from analysis paralysis. So today we're going to discuss briefly the broader SICK thesis. So SICK stands for silicon carbide. This isn't your typical bull thesis wankathon. We're going to focus on shooting holes in the thesis. We're going to look at main players in the story, mainly around 8-inch wafer production. And if you're familiar with the SICK story, you'll know why that's relevant. We're going to look at pure plainness. We're going to discuss wolf speed a bit more on the back of a recent research piece we did on the topic. Mainly, are they going to survive? And most importantly, what are key metrics for investors or would-be investors to watch? And we're going to try to simplify what uh, we found to be an extremely complex topic because there's so much commentary out there about it. Now, a short history of SICK or silicon carbide. It's a wafer of silicon and carbon compressed, and uh, Sir Elon of Musk used his first principles thinking and employed this new material in Tesla's traction inverter. And what it basically does is for several hundred dollars more to use this miracle material that translates to $2,500 in savings through better vehicle design. So, for example, batteries can be smaller and last longer. Um, however, uh, Tesla's use of SICK is in question. We're going to talk about that later. Um, so as this technology improves, larger wafers can be produced, which lower the cost of production, which spurs adoption. Uh, so everything moves to 8-inch because of this great chart from a Digitimes research special report I came across. We're very grateful to these folks based out of Taiwan for the work they did on this that we're going to leverage throughout this presentation. Here you can see the efficiency I talked about between the 6-inch six, six wafers and the 8-inch. You know, you can just cut more pieces out of it, if you will, uh, so you have less losses. You can see that there. And then the uh, single chip cost comparison between the larger wafer and the smaller wafers, that larger wafer is actually less. So it's uh, it's beneficial across the board. And the leader in SICK right now in terms of wafers supplied, so we're going to differentiate between materials and products that use SICK. So Wolf Speed is the technology leader in this industry. So that's very important because we only invest in leaders and basically automotive is the fastest growing and majority use case. That's why we're interested, because we want exposure to electric vehicles without investing in OEMs. Or we'd be open to investing in an OEM such as BYD, but we'd like to explore the EV chip thesis. So uh, equally attractive are also their non-auto use cases, uh, like industrial and energy, which is actually seeing a, a retraction right now. But Wolf Speed exited their RF business. You can see that on the chart here. Uh, so that's just something worth noting. Now, if you're interested in our previous research, you can start here and look these articles up on our website. We're building on that research. The bull thesis has uh, been discussed ad nauseum. So what are reasons to avoid wolf speed? Well, we can use this SWOT analysis, uh, something, a tool they give you in B school. Uh, I've highlighted the right-hand side. Weaknesses for uh, for wolf speed would be poor execution. We'll talk about that. And their heavy leverage. Uh, threats would be competition, especially China. And then on the left-hand side, you have strengths, whether well, the leader and opportunities, well, the growth of uh, silicon carbide. So this piece from Digitimes Asia from late last year is very telling. So it says that previously silicon carbide materials from China accounted for only 5% of the global market. However, by 2024, they're expected to grab a substantial market share. So there's approximately four to five leading companies engaged in uh, silicon carbide crystal growth in China. And so you can just measure their capacity to figure out uh, China's capacity, right, or contribution to global production. So that was around 60,000 units a month. That's going to double this year. So they're going to be producing about 1.5 million units annually. And to put that into perspective, the estimated global supply of sick wafers in 2023, so last year, was 1.7 million units. So it's predicted that China's 2024 supply could potentially, that's this year, could potentially account for about half of the global market share. So that would imply, what, a 3 million unit demand. So the other question we had here is how long before the Chinese start producing 8-inch wafers? And this piece didn't say, but 
Um, just look at what China did to the solar panel industry, and you ought to be very scared if you're somebody in the U.S. that's um, competing against the Chinese when it comes to anything silicon-based. So let's talk a little bit about economics, supply versus demand. So silicon carbide is needed for electric vehicles, and they're growing like mad. It means there isn't enough silicon carbide. Consequently, everyone's ramping production. We see that. Now, since there's not enough supply right now, costs are going to be high, and OEMs are looking for substitutes, and Tesla's done that. We'll discuss that in a second. What happens then is that demand decreases, and when that massive supply comes online, and there's no turning around that investment ship once you start building a factory, then you've got all this excess supply, and price wars ensue, and then the Chinese will clean house like they did with solar panels. That's the concern. And when you look at Tesla here, it says Tesla plans to slash silicon carbide use, sending some chip makers' shares down. You can see the usual suspects here. Look at this little excerpt on the right. So it differentiates between sick materials and sick devices. So that's very important to note. For sick materials, they cite Wolf Core and Rome, and we'll talk about those. Uh, and then you can see here they say that the possibility of cheaper chips could drive up EV adoption globally, again, going back to the 8-inch um, production that's coming online. So why did Tesla do this? Well, probably because of the cost and supply considerations. They figured out a way to use 75% less sick without compromising the performance or the efficiency of the car. And uh, according to Digitimes, it's said that Tesla has gotten a hold of virtually all of STM's SIC capacity. Now, STM is a notable player, three cited in this Digitimes research special report on the SIC wafer industry status for 8-inch wafers. Three players mentioned, STM, Wolfspeed, we already know enough about them, and Rome, which is a Japanese firm. So when it comes to STM, this was raised on our last EV chip video as somebody correctly pointed out, the uh, acceleration of STM's sick revenues. But we look at exposure. So even though they might have had a billion dollars in sick revenues last year, that's just 6% of total revenues. You're not getting a lot of that exposure. If they hit the $5 billion mark seven years from now, so it's expected by, I think, 2030, they're going to have $5 billion. That means you're waiting seven years to get 29% exposure to the sick thesis. And in the meantime, if the other part of their business grows, then you're actually going to have less exposure. That's a good problem to have, right? But if the other side of their business shrinks, that's going to offset the sick growth. And then what do you really have? Well, you have more exposure, but overall you haven't fared too well. This is why we're looking for more of a pure play than a firm like STM that gives you broader exposure. Reminiscent of this would be Qualcomm's supposed exposure to auto. And you look at the numbers, well, it's only 7% of total revenues. Well, that's not a lot of exposure, even though they may be a big player in that space. So when we look at Rome, they're the third 8-inch player. And you can see here that they've made an $800 million investment for the years of 2021 through 2025. Uh, they have uh, volume production starting, they say, this year with $600 million in revs and an added 15% market share by 2025. So then they say by that they currently have 15 and that they'd have 30 by next year. Well, hard to say, but uh, we'd like to extend a thank you to Digitimes for the great work they did that um, we used and leveraged in our presentation. So just before we get to talking about wolf speed some more i wanted to draw your attention to our online store which you can access just right below this video and here's some of the artifacts in there so our dividend growth report that's still on sale that shouldn't be i'm going to have to chastise one of our interns please don't buy that because it's supposed to be at full price wait till we change it to full price then buy it we have our new money portfolio there you can see that's a uh, collection of 20 stocks, 10 dividend growth, and 10 disruptive growth stocks we find most compelling. And then, of course, there's the usual merch. Throughout this year, we're going to be adding artifacts. These are just some of the things that Nanalyze Premium subscribers enjoy with a subscription. So thoughts on Wolf Speed. Great build it and they will come story here. And I, I did the original research piece that we put out in 2022, and I found it more compelling than I thought I would. But it's an extremely complex thesis with lots of moving parts. That's evident by the amount of complex analysis you can find in the wild. It's incredible how many firms out there have really dug into this. So what you then need to do is try to make things simpler. And you can do that by identifying simple metrics to avoid analysis paralysis. We did that here. Three metrics, revenues, 
ultimate ground truth that this company's produced something that customers are buying. That extends across the board in disruptive growth investing. Gross margins. You, you have to have positive gross margins, otherwise you don't have a business. These need to be trending upwards. We're going to talk about why they're in the wrong space right now. And survivability, that comes down to, for Wolfspeed, because they're spending so much CapEx, that comes down to free cash flows, which include that CapEx expenditure. So poor execution is one thing that, uh, that Wolfspeed is guilty of. So if you look at their 2022 analyst day, they guided to $1.6 billion in fiscal 2024. In May of last year, suddenly they guided to $1 billion to $1.1 billion. That's assuming a 20% capacity utilization at Mohawk Valley. That's the big factory they're trying to get online by Q4 2024. That's fiscal. And the fact that somebody should be taken out back and shot for using fiscal years, it makes things so confusing. So weeks ago in their earnings call, they said they're on track for 20% 20 utilization in fourth quarter of fiscal 2024. So they should hit that guidance, right? Doesn't look like it. So here you can see revenues for fiscal 2024. You have actuals there, Q1 and Q2. Then you have Q3. That's at their midpoint guidance. And then Q4 would need to hit close to $400 million just to hit the low end of their guidance. So they've they have a real problem with forecasting revenues, and that comes down to one metric, which is that utilization. Guess what? Shares wouldn't be trading so low if guidance was met. We said that in our last piece. We said if things don't go well with their new factory, shares are going to take a beating, and they have. They're simply not executing in markets, punishing them for that. So time equals money, and these delays are going to create balance sheet weaknesses and potential dilution. And the outcome is either one of two stories. Management writes the ship in the coming year, valuations return to normal, and shares outperform as management continues to execute through 2030, realizing the potential of the story. Or you have poor execution that continues, and the value of this opportunity is eroded as Wolf Speed isn't able to accomplish nearly what they've promised investors. And you ask yourself, which outcome seems more likely today? Well, <laughs> they really need to restore some confidence for investors. And one problem when you think about systemic risks and survivability is free cash flow. Remember, we mentioned that as a metric to watch. So they blew through. $3 billion in cash over the past rolling year. You see these charts on the right? One on the top there is the actuals. The one, this is the free cash flow. So you see it's trending downwards, but it's quite volatile. The chart below that simply um, does a rolling one-year window into that. So you see that trend? That's not good. So they have $2.6 billion in cash left. Well, they, blow th they blew through $3 billion over the last uh, last rolling year. Raising more debt is not an option. So their debt to equity is somewhere around four, where uh, greater than two is considered risky. So are they going to sell depressed shares to raise more cash? Well, that concern that they're going to dilute shareholders causes the share price to drop, and that's a vicious cycle. So the question here is, when's this trend going to reverse that the arrow's pointing to there? And that's what, if you're an investor, you need to be watching, paying very close attention to that. And this, I think, was taken from their 2022 investor deck, and it shows that this year, or say fiscal 2024, is expected to be the worst year for the company. And it remains to be seen then uh, if they're able to turn that around. You see, is, is the cash they have remaining sufficient to get them all the way through uh, fiscal year 2026 when they expect to have positive free cash flows? Well, we just don't know. And that uncertainty, of course, is having an impact on shares. Here you can see this chart by Simply Wall Street showing that spike in debt and that spike in cash alongside the debt. Of course, that cash is being eroded as they spend, I think, this last quarter, $750 million in free cash flow went out the door. And then that creates a problem, right, uh, as their uh, ratios um, start to rise. And there we've charted their shares outstanding. So those have been going up over the past three years, but they seem to have steadied out over the past year. We'll see if there's any sort of equity raise. This is a great chart, which shows how they expect cash to be neutral at 30 to 40% utilization for Mohawk Valley. So 
at the end of this fiscal year, they're expecting to have 20 to 25 percent utilization. When they get to 30 to 40, then cash neutral and they'll stop burning so much cash. So the question here, do we sacrifice some upside and invest when outcomes seem more certain? For example, do we wait until there's 30 to 40 percent utilization when free cash flows are uh, the trend reverses? You say, well, you know, you want to, uh, there's the fury of missing out, right? I want to get involved right now and, and while the shares are a bargain. Well, there's also some risk associated with that. So when we look at gross margins, I found this very interesting in their last quarter. They said gross margins, I had to read it twice, are affected by 1,800 basis points. So not 1.8%, but 18%. Uh, based on underutilization related to that new factory. So they're actually, their gross margins are being penalized heavily. And if you look, if you back that out, if they don't have that underutilization, you're at a 34.5% gross margin. Certainly not the in the 50s that they had uh, said, I think that was back in, in 2019 or 2020, they, they talked about hitting those numbers. But uh, what this tells us then uh, is that it's all about utilization. It's the important metric to watch. Backlog that they have tells us they can sell all their production. They just need to get that utilization up and, and hope that they can survive until that happens. So next up, what we're going to do is decide what we want to do with Wolf Speed. Uh, we're going to communicate that to premium subscribers, I think, in a trade alert. Uh, we're going to explore some other sick players, names like Infineon and On Semi. Um, if wafers are only an input for a company, then price wars are actually a good thing. That that is a big difference then between if you're just if you're a majority supplier of wafers or if you're somebody that just consumes wafers and a majority producer of products based on those wafers. Now, what we found, of course, is that semiconductors are a rabbit hole, so we want to start reining this whole thing in first by getting some closure on the sick thesis. Next up, I think, is a premium article on Indie Semiconductor. This is part of our continuing search for some pure play exposure to the growth of electric vehicles. And I've identified a number of companies here that we're going to be looking at next. Names like NXP, On, Allegro, Excellus, Indie, and Infineon. And you'll see some names crossed off here like Qualcomm and Wolf Speed for obvious reasons and AEH, AEHR. If you're curious why we cross those out, you're going to want to watch this next video. It talks about why we're looking for EV chips in the first place. Please make sure to subscribe to our channel to support our work. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.